Good morning and welcome to our UBC Learning Circle, uh, Indigenous Health Administration Leadership Program, I Help for Short, Information Session 2024 with Melanie, Cynthia, Gloria, Emily, uh, Karen, Sonia, and Kevin. Today's conversation is presented in partnership with the Center for Excellence in Indigenous Health. We'd like to thank the First Nations Health Authority for generously funding the UBC Learning Circle and allowing us to have these conversations. And before we formally begin, I'd like to acknowledge with respect and gratitude that I'm joining you from the unceded territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh Nations. And for those of you who don't know me, my name is Serene Squawkin. I'm the Learning Circle Manager. I am Silk Okanagan on my mother's side and Hickory Apache in Belgian on my father's side. Um, I'll be the moderator for today's discussion and working behind the scenes is Cynthia, our production coordinator. She'll be in the background um, interacting with everyone in the chat. And finally, before we get into today's discussion, we'll pro provide a gentle heads up that the topics may be uh, sensitive or emotionally triggering. Please make sure you are looking after yourself. And if at any point in time you need to talk to an elder, friend, counselor, or family member, don't hesitate to do so. We have some prompts in the chat for you if you need additional support. Now I'll turn it over to Melanie to open us. Good morning, everyone. My name is Melanie Rivers. I'm from the Squamish First Nation and also of Scottish ancestry. My ancestral name is Tealtawit, and that's my great 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 grandmother's name. I work with the iHelp program, and in a moment, we'll introduce uh, all our hosts and speakers today uh, for the, today's information session. But first, I just wanted to start us off uh, just to get grounded um, and to acknowledge the the traditional lands that we're all on. We're all zooming in, <clears throat> zooming in from different locations. And uh, <clears throat> sorry, I'm still recovering from a cold here. Um, so just uh, um, acknowledging the lands that we're on, the trees, the stones, the earth, the water, uh, the mountains, uh, the birds, the animals. Uh, just acknowledging them today and also the ancestors. You know, our ancestors gather when we gather, come to check out what we're checking out, what we're talking about. Um, and we um, are very excited today to share with you the Indigenous Health Administration and Leadership Program. We're recruiting for the next cohort of amazing individuals. Um, <clears throat> absolutely love working with the participants of the of this program. Um, it's uh, Indigenous uh, people who are passionate about working in health and uh, the uh, conversations and networks are, are absolutely amazing. So, so excited to be here today and to answer any of your questions uh, for those that are thinking of applying or if you know someone who is thinking of applying to the program, the applications are open and um, we'll talk more about all the logistics as we go to. Um, so I want to... Um, uh, have everyone introduce themselves that's here today. Um, I will be going through some slides and pausing at different points to have um, different folks uh, share from, from their experience with the program. So um, I, I will uh, uh, start with our, our partner. Uh, this um, So I work at the Center for Excellence in Indigenous Health at UBC. Uh, I've been there for, I think, four or five years now. Um, I've also worked um, in the Indigenous health field for 25 years, um, working in the areas of health education and policy, um, worked at the First Nations Health Authority for about five years, um, and worked at the BC Centre for Disease Control for about 15 years doing um, HIV AIDS education in, in First Nations communities around the province. So just to let you know a little bit about uh, my background and I support the program, um, sometimes instruct in the program and um, uh, work with the instructors and our peer support workers and um, from all of those places. So the center um, partners with Extended Learning. Uh, this is a longstanding partnership. Um, we've been partners since I think 2004. I always forget the exact year because it's been a long time and it predates me. Um, but this is a, a long-standing, respectful partnership, um, a stable partnership that has supported the 
the IHELP program for, for many years. Um, so I'm pleased to um, ask Karen um, to introduce herself. Welcome everyone. And thank you for um, uh, starting us off on this, in this, what we're hoping will be a, a new journey for some, some new learners starting the cohort this year. Um, so my name is Karen Rolson, as Melanie said. I, um, I've been here at UBC on Musqueam land. Um, deeply appreciated, appreciate uh, the opportunity to um, live and work uh, at, at UBC or close to UBC for 25 years. This is my 25th year, as you can see the gray streak coming through my hair here. <laughs> Um, but it's been an amazing journey and, and honestly working, um, with our partners, uh, on the iHelp program has, is, is always the highlight. Um, it's a, it's a beautiful partnership, um, where from the extended learning side, we were the non-credit adult learning career and professional learning arm of the campus. So our, our work is to, um, provide programs that meet the needs of adult learners wherever they are in, in their personal and professional learning desires, um, whether it's to get a new um, employment opportunity or to really hone some skills that they can contribute to their work in their community. Um, so we partner with the Center for Excellence in Indigenous Health um, and have, as Melanie said, since 2004, so it's almost in 20 years, um, to do exactly that for um, Indigenous learners across across the province and, and sometimes from outside the province as well. Um, so, you know, flexible, uh, where we're, the, the program you'll hear more is, is, is really designed for you to, to kind of work with your, um, your other competing demands in your life. Um, I'm here with two colleagues, um, Cynthia Tam and Emily Wu. Um, if you want to just say hello and say who you are. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Emily Wu. I work closely with uh, Karen and uh, Cynthia and Melanie on this program. Um, I, I, recite, um, I, I joining today from the um, Musqueam and um, Tsleil-Waututh territory, uh, Asida territory, um, and also known as Vancouver. Um, I've been with the program for four years now since the beginning of the pandemic. Um, still fairly new, but the program now um, has a large online component to support learners who um, are not able to join us um, in person. But they're part of um, there are some in person residencies um, for, uh, which you'll learn more uh, during the session. So we look forward to working with you and uh, support you in your next journey. Everyone, um, I'm Cynthia Tam. I'm a senior program assistant at UBC Extended Learning, and I work with Emily and Karen. Um, I support the administrative side of the program. Um, so if you have any questions about admission requirements, the application process, or even the program schedule, um, just contact me by phone or email. And um, yeah, I look forward to getting your inquiries about the program. Thank you. So that's the team that meets every couple of weeks and does all the behind the scenes work on, on the program. Um, so I want to invite uh, Sonia next to introduce herself. We have a peer support role with the program, which is someone that's been through the iHealth program as a participant um, and then um, comes back to kind of be a bit of a cheerleader and, and support um, uh, participants as they go through the program and um, also share their experience um, working in, in whatever organization uh, or field that they're in. So turn over to you, Sonia. Good morning. Thank you. Um, thank you, Melanie. Uh, my name is, uh, as Melanie said, Sonia, and I sometimes will go by Schneider just because in the community, that's my status card. <laughs> so um, I... I live and I come from the Squamish Nation and I live in the Capilano um, village 
and I work for the Squamish Nation Home and Community Care uh, Health Division in our community. And uh, I took the program and completed it in 2019. Um, and then I was approached uh, by Melanie to come on, I think it's been three years now, uh, to be a, the peer mentor. Um, so uh, I found the program uh, to this day very helpful in a lot of the, uh, you know, where we steer, uh, basically where we steer the ship and keeping it culturally sensitive, as well as um, I learned a lot about our culture because I didn't grow up, uh, you know, on the reserve. I I grew up more Western. My other side of myself is I'm German. So um, taking the program taught me a lot. Uh, it felt like my feet were planted and grounded in a lot of our culture. Um, I, I am a cheerleader by nature, but when I was asked to do this uh, peer mentoring, I, I actually enjoy uh, I enjoy helping others to, um, and I've learned a lot. <laughs> Even to, to, to this day as a peer mentor, I've learned a lot from um, other uh, students and stuff, and I've learned even more sitting in a little bit in some of the classes. So it's been very rich, this program. I'll cherish it for the rest of my entire life. So yes, thank you. Thanks, Sonia. And we'll ask her a little bit later to share a bit more about the, the role. Um, so I'll have uh, Gloria and Kevin introduce themselves now. And, um, and then uh, a bit later, we'll have them share a bit more about their experience with the program. So we'll start with Gloria. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Gloria Harding. Uh, my family uh, is the Ghost Keeper and Boudry on both sides. And I'm from the Métis Nation of Alberta, Peavine Settlement. And um, I'm a student with the iHelp program, and I help help my career and save my career. So thank you. Thank you. And Kevin? Hi everyone, uh, my name is Kevin Hill. I'm a Mohawk from Six Nations, Ontario. Uh, my background is in uh, criminology. Uh, and so I worked uh, 15 years in the downtown east side in community corrections, uh, working at downtown community court in the Vancouver intensive supervision unit uh, before making the jump over to uh, provincial health services authority. Uh, so yes, uh, I'm fairly new to uh, the healthcare uh, background and uh, healthcare practices. Uh, so I hope it has been a huge help uh, for me. Great, thank you everyone for all the introductions and thanks for those introducing yourselves in the chat there. It's great to see who's dialing in today and where you're from and um, some of the work that you're doing. Um, so I'm gonna share some slides now and talk a bit more about the program itself. Um, and we will have a, a question and answer period um, at the end as well. Um, so really this program has been designed to promote the health and wellness of Indigenous people. So this really is for, for you, your communities and your families. Um, and we really do um, root and ground the program in these core values of resiliency, culture and Indigenous perspectives. So, you know, all the, you know, we've got Indigenous instructors, we have all the readings and um, uh, assignments are geared towards um, Indigenous, uh, you know, how to apply this in Indigenous settings. Um, so that really is the foundation of the program. Um, so uh, next slide, thanks. So as I said, this um, this program is delivered in partnership um, with uh, UBC Extended Learning and the Center for Excellence in Indigenous Health um, since 2004. And <clears throat> as, as many of you know, working in Indigenous communities, it's not always easy working with uh, our non-Indigenous partners. Um, and we are delivering this program within you know, a larger structure, the, the university itself, which um, you know can be quite a colonial setting. So we you know, really look for partners that are going to hold us up and um, be respectful and 
um, be true true partners with us. And so this um, this is a true partnership, and that's where I like to put my efforts uh, is into partnerships that um, are going to really support our people to um, have programs that are gonna um, support them in their work. So next slide. <clears throat> um, so as I go, um, you know, just this will be to see if, if you feel like this program might be a fit for you. So, um, you know, if you have questions as we get um, um, towards the end, you can um, put those in the, in the chat as well. Um, so, this program is designed to build and enhance your knowledge of health administration. So this is um, within Indigenous um, organizations and communities. And so designed to help you confidently design, lead, and deliver holistic health and wellness programming. So we look at um, health and wellness from Indigenous perspectives and um, all our conversations and readings and assignments are about how to apply this. It's a really a uh, practical sort of application type program um, rather than sort of a theoretical type program. So, you know, many um, of the participants um, do their assignments directly in relation to a, wor a works work project that they're working on. So it can directly be uh, supporting them in the moment um, as they're doing uh, their work. Uh, we do have other participants that join um, the program that aren't working in Indigenous health yet, but hope to. So we've got uh, that range as well. So next slide. So as I said, it's centered on Indigenous approaches and traditional teachings. Um, so we have um, opening circle every uh, course. So there's five courses. Um, um, we'll get into the logistics, but we do have some of the courses are in person. And when we're in person, we have a, a really nice um, classroom. I like it because it has natural light, um, but we have a spot um, where we can permanently leave a circle of chairs up. And then we have um, the other part of the classroom where there's tables to to sit and and have um, our class discussions. So um, opening circle can sometimes take three hours um, and we um, invite uh, Musqueam Elder to come and sit with us in circle and kind of hold that hold that space with us. And um, you know, people get a chance to to share um, you know, what's going on for them in the program, but also in their communities. There's tears, there's laughter, there's um, lots of support happening. So, um, so those parts are are the rich parts of of working uh, with our with our traditional teachings, and also having um, elders be a part of the program. So, next slide. So uh, we do our best to create a culturally safe and supportive learning environment. And just like the definition of cultural safety in a, in a healthcare setting, really that can only be defined by the participants of the program, whether they feel it's culturally safe. Um, we do have um, uh, participants that have told us that, you know, their last school experience was going to Indian day school and, you know, they were nervous and scared to come on, on campus and that they, um, you know, didn't realize that there would be a safe place, safe place, uh, and we're grateful for that. So um, we're very aware that you know people are coming from different experiences with with education and the school system, and may have experienced you know racism or you know been to residential school, and and so that's very much in the back of our minds as we um, create a, a, a learning environment uh, for people to feel um, like their their voice matters and that they're a part of the, the learning circle and the learning community. The next slide. <clears throat> so supports for you in the program. Um, so uh, we hear this um, over and over again and throughout the cohort. So people go through as a cohort together so they get a chance to know each other. Um, so your peers become <clears throat> friends, colleagues and mentors. Um, we have the dedicated peer mentor role. Um, so someone that's completed the program in the past and is working in an indigenous health setting. So this past year we had uh, Sonia in this role. Um, <clears throat> uh, we have elders that participate in circles and ceremony. We have our graduation ceremony at the UBC Longhouse. Um, so we get to be amongst uh, the house posts and go through the ceremonial door. Um, and it's a beautiful celebration at the end of, of the program. 
uh, staff and instructors to guide you along the way. So the instructors that we have in the program are um, primarily Indigenous or maybe all Indigenous. Um, <clears throat> and if they um, aren't Indigenous, they have worked in Indigenous communities for many years. Um, and so they are working um, professionals working in uh, Indigenous health work. So we bring in some amazing instructors uh, into the program and uh, bring that diversity of voices as well. Um, so um, supports for you too, flexibility for, for when life throws challenges your way. So we're also aware that many of our people are dealing with <clears throat> a crisis in their community or in their family. Um, you know, a judge, juggling school and work and family. And so, you know, it's good to not get um, behind, um, but when something does happen, we do provide some flexibility uh, for that. Uh, we do have a list of uh, Indigenous mental health supports um, and learning resources to support um, people in their writing or their approach to learning and time management. <clears throat> I'm just going to take a sip of my tea because I'm still... Getting over this cold, I'm hoping my voice is going to hold out. I haven't talked this long for a while. <clears throat> okay, so next slide. Oh, good. So now I'm going to ask Sonia to share. This will uh, give, me, give me a chance to give my voice a break. So, um, yeah, we're very pleased to have Sonia um, in the peer support role this past year and in, in previous years. And um, just to share, Sonia, a little bit more about your experience, but also how how some of the logistics of how you support um, the participants in the program. Sure. Um, so as peer mentor, uh, I would um, help along any students that just need had questions or anything I would uh, coordinate with instructors, uh, any questions in case... Uh, obviously, the instructor may be busy with work or other engagements. So, um, I would. I also hold uh, a weekly tea time. We called it, and that was a time from about nine till about nine thirty. Uh, we would get together through Zoom and just sometimes just visit, and that was also a way for. Uh, other students to get together and, and get to know each other. And, um, and so we would go through a lot of the material um, in tea time. But then of course, if the instructor, if it was a question I couldn't answer, I would email uh, the teacher and of course, just help facilitate some of those questions. And if they had late assignments um, are needed, um, to just let the instructor know that they're going to be late. I would, you know, work with them with dates. And then if they are missing any classes or anything, then I'll, of course I would work with the instructor to also send a makeup assignment. So um, we would send a lot of our information or our, a lot of the information gets sent through Canvas. So we try to work through uh, the UBC uh, Canvas but sometimes I would have to reach out uh, through a phone call or just just some friendly reminders, um, just to keep people, because people get really busy, but it's a, a very doable uh, course. So again, the peer mentor is just that in-between uh, person to help out with any questions and any uh material that they might not understand, although I'm not the teacher, so I would try my best to just give my experience and sometimes most times the light bulb would go off in some of the students so um i also uh let's see here just again just really working in this in a lot of us work in communities or maybe not working in communities so i would try to just work with them where they were at um in their work area so Again, I could only answer mainly for uh, community engagement areas, but the instructor is a huge help. So that's kind of what I what I did. Hope I covered everything, Melanie. <laughs> it's kind of been an interesting journey the last three years, but I've enjoyed it tremendously. So 
Thank you. Which goes, thank you, Sonia. Um, okay, so next slide. <clears throat> so we've mentioned this a little bit, but um, you know, we hear from the participants, but also in the evaluations that um, they build lifelong connections with each other. So it isn't easy <clears throat> doing this work um, in sometimes remote communities or working in the indigenous program amongst the non-indigenous organization. Um, and, you know, so the challenges of facing, you know, systemic racism, um, facing isolation in remote areas. Um, so building these connections where you can, you know, continue the relationships past the program where you can um, connect with people around what they're doing in their communities um, and support each other to, to continue that work. Um, I saw Gloria nodding her head there. <laughs> We all know it's not easy uh, working in in our communities and in indigenous health, and um, we need we need the supports and to learn from people that are doing good work um, in this area as well. So next slide. Um, so as I mentioned, the um, the courses are each course sometimes has just one instructor or maybe two or three, uh, depending on the topics. Um, and primarily taught by Indigenous instructors. So we have a mix of um, Métis and First Nations instructors, um, and um, they are they are out there doing the work. Um, so um, they, are, uh, they are engaged um, professionals. I am very excited to, to say we have Len Pierre booked for this coming year for uh, teaching one of the courses. Um, and, um, so we really uh, work to bring in quality instructors uh, into the program. <clears throat> and then uh, we do have a flexible program format, so it can allow you to do your work and your family commitments along with um, doing the program. Although you do need some support <clears throat> from your employer because some of the classes are on um, a Thursday and a Friday, uh, but we'll share that in the next slide. So ready for the next slide. Um, so the format of the courses, so we have five courses, um, and one, um, where we come together at the end is to kind of integrate and celebrate, um, the learnings and also have graduation. So courses are either <clears throat> virtual, uh, which are weekly. So the courses that are virtual are every, every Friday morning from 9.30 to noon. Uh, we found that two and a half hours is sort of the sweet spot in terms of not getting Zoom fatigued um, and having that weekly consistency um, with each other. And then the in-person courses um, are three days. So Thursday, Friday, Saturday. And people fly in from various locations um, and many stay on campus. And <clears throat> we have a um, wonderful time being in person together. So the duration is one year part-time. Um, there's the cost of the program, which um, can be paid in two installments. Uh, we do have um, an early application review. Um, actually, if uh, someone could pop in the chat what that actual date is, that would be great. Um, <clears throat> so it's great if you are applying uh, to submit um, by the early application review date, if you can. And then the final application deadline is April 3rd, so March 4th. Um, early application. So we do two review points uh, to give folks a little more heads up in terms of um, um, getting life settled and sorted for the program. Um, and then the tuition deadline is April 26. And the program starts May 17th. So we have one course that happens in May, June, and then we have the summer off. And then uh, we have um, courses through um, through you know, October, November, December, Christmas break, um, and then uh, into, I think Cynthia will know all the dates exactly, but I think it's around April or May when we when we finish, or March or April when we finish the, the program. Okay, so next slide. <clears throat> so is this program for me? Um, 
Uh, so we've designed it for people with a passion for making a difference in health and well-being of Indigenous people. So whether that's in remote, rural, um, or urban settings. So we do have that mix. So some people are working in cities, some people are working in remote areas. Um, most are in British Columbia, but we have some that join us from, from other provinces. <clears throat> And some have extensive experience. Um, they've already been working in Indigenous health work uh, for many years, and some are just at the beginning of their learning journey. And that can be a beautiful balance. Uh, sometimes we have the sort of younger participants and then those that have been in the field a little longer. And um, it's um, really great to have the different voices uh, in the circle. So people interested in a career in Indigenous health programming, administration, and leadership. Uh, we do have... Um, the program's primarily for First Nations, Inuit, Métis people. I'd say about 90% to 95% of the participants are Indigenous. And then we do have some non-Indigenous allies that join the program. Um, but these are not people that are just starting. They're learning about Indigenous people. These are people that are living and working in Indigenous communities, uh, organizations. Um, and that's so that we can create that learning environment where Indigenous participants don't have to be um, educating the non-Indigenous uh, participants. Um, and it can, they can just kind of take a sigh and, you know, understand that everyone in the room already has an extensive understanding of Indigenous people. Um, so people that are interested in or are working in First Nations health centers, friendship centers, health authorities, um, so Indigenous programs within health authorities, uh, Métis health programs and Indigenous nonprofit organizations, BC, Yukon, and across Canada. Okay, so next slide. So here's a picture of um, last year's cohort. Um, love all the smiling faces. Um, and uh, I think at this point, I'll ask um, uh, Gloria and, and Kevin to share their experience with the program. Because um, that, um, you know, hearing from someone that's directly in the program right now, I think is is really valuable um, from their perspective of what it's like being in the program and juggling that with work and how it's um, supporting them in their um, their work and their careers. So I'm going to start with uh, Gloria. Uh, Tanse. Um, yes, I, I'm uh, a student with the AI Health program, as I had mentioned earlier, and I'm from the Métis Nation of Alberta. And um, I'm currently, um, for the last two years, I've been the Indigenous Relations Manager with the Nanaimo um, Primary Care Network and the Nanaimo Division of Family Practice, which is a non-Indigenous um, organization. And the Nanaimo um, Division of Family Practice um, consists of a membership of 300 physicians in the Nanaimo and Catchment area. And my role is to ensure that they understand culturally safe practices in healthcare. And um, I was having a major struggle. Um, I One of the reasons I was hired was because of lived experience. And um, I'm also a member of, of the Big House in Musqueam. I was initiated in 1998 by Elder Vince Stogan. So because of my experiences and my understanding of the Coast Salish culture, they hired me. And um, then there was this expectation, and I'm familiar with some of it, but that I would um, have a lot of knowledge about change management. And, and strategic planning and whatnot. And, and while I was familiar with that, it didn't really align with my way of thinking, which is more of an organic type of thinking with, you know, um, implementing strategies, etc. And I was really struggling. And I was at a point of walking out of here and never looking back, because I just felt so inadequate. And my um, boss would say to me, well, you got to find your confidence. And how do you find confidence in an organization where you know the attitude of a lot of people is, oh, we're sick of hearing about your trauma. And, you know, and, and that systemic racism, you know, if we look at in plain sight, you know, we know what's going on in healthcare in British Columbia. So um, 
I, I, I think it was more so in desperation. I just started looking and searching and I found the iHelp program. And I, I need to say that it saved my career because um, it helped me learn how to align Western uh, business practices with traditional um, trauma-informed care practices and, and be able to navigate that. And, and through the elders um, from Shanem First Nation and, and um, I help, I've learned that sometimes people are engaging in systemic racism in healthcare that are non-Indigenous people, and they don't even know it. They don't even realize what they're saying is hurtful. So, so don't take it personal. Educate, educate. So um, I help has really helped me navigate that. It's helped me build my career. Um, I now have a strategic um, cultural safety framework. Um, I'm being consulted with by other primary care networks about how do you do your job? Like, how does that, what does that look like? So becoming kind of a role model in the um, primary care network communities on Vancouver Island. And it's just been an honor and a privilege to have that. And I never could have done that without this program, Melanie. And I, I want all, you know, all everyone in this room to know how grateful I am because you helped save my career. And I, I know I would have walked out of here. And and I'm I'm also grateful at the end of the day too to the Metis Nation of British Columbia and the Nanaimo Division of Family Practice. They paid for me to take this program. And 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 I, I have so much to offer now because I can put my visions into strategy. So thank you. Oh my relations. <clears throat> Thank you, Gloria. It's so wonderful to hear um, how this program has impacted you. Um, yeah, it fills my heart today. Thank you. Uh, so, Kevin? Hey, everyone. Uh, yeah, very similar to uh, Gloria uh, coming in from Corrections. Uh, and so right now, my current role is I'm uh, the uh, Indigenous Patient Navigator with the Community Transition Team. Uh, within uh, Provincial Health Services Authority. And so my role is I work with uh, Correctional Health Services and creating and developing developing uh, plans for individuals who will be released from uh, the correctional centers in Lower Mainland and returning back to uh, the community. And so what my role is, is I work with the uh, Indigenous uh, population that are in the correctional centers and help develop uh, release plans and plans where they won't fall through the cracks again once they're back in the community, uh, connecting them with health services uh, in the community, making sure that they're uh, attending all of their probation meetings uh, and any type of other uh, court ordered meetings that they're going to have uh, put on them. Uh, but in regards to the program, when I first came in uh, to correctional health, uh, from being a community correctional officer, a uh, lot of imposter syndrome. And this program really helped break down uh, that wall that I was uh, up against. And it gave me the confidence and gave me the understanding of uh, how the healthcare system works, how it operates, and how being as an in Indigenous uh, person, uh, where I fit into that. Uh, mold as well too and how I can help uh, create and mold a new type of system as well too that will benefit our people uh, in my specific role uh, in the correctional centers and so yeah just understanding uh, how to create a strategic plan how to uh, do program development understanding the ins and outs when it comes to creating a budget for such programs as well too and the big thing as well too is just understanding uh as indigenous people having a one foot in both worlds with your indigenous uh culture and in the western uh the western ways as well too and being true to yourself and sticking to your own cultural beliefs and values uh and being able to accomplish everything that you still want to accomplish when it comes to uh your own personal uh, goals that you have set out for yourself and walking that path uh, 
with individuals like-minded as yourself in this program. Uh, one of the big things as well, too, is creating that network of people that you can uh, reach out to when you have questions. Uh, so we have individuals from all across Turtle Island uh, who are have their own expertise and their own uh, individual traits that can benefit you as well, too, uh, that you're going to be able to tap into. And I, I honestly find that huge because I ask so many questions to individuals in my uh, in my course just about stuff that is going on in my work and how would you navigate this? How would you navigate this? Have you come upon this situation before? And just that wealth of knowledge that we have at our fingertips now is, is just huge and I'm so grateful uh, to have experienced this. And I'm looking forward to uh, graduation and uh, graduating with this class. So thank you. Much good. Thank you, Kevin, for sharing your experience with the program. I really appreciate it. Um, <clears throat> okay, so we'll go to the next slide. Um, so there, as I said, there's five courses in the program. Each one of these bullets kind of represents an entire course. Um, and uh, so I'll just um, explain the what what's involved in the program. And then I see that Auntie Doris has joined us. So I'll um, give her a chance to share a few words in a moment about her um, participation with the iHelp program and um, share a few encouraging words. She does an amazing job of lifting us all up um, and encouraging us. Um, <clears throat> so really it's the fundamental skills in Indigenous health, Indigenous community health administration. Uh, we do call the program iHelp for short because it's really long to say the Indigenous Health Administration and Leadership Program. Um, and so there's an entire course on communication and leadership skills. And this is from Indigenous um, teachings and perspectives and also just navigating like, you know, what um, what is your style of leadership and how do you integrate that with um you know, again, balancing these, um, working in the, the Western medical system, health system, and also with uh, traditional teachings. Uh, there's a whole course on um, sort of the fundamentals and things like um, <clears throat> human resources. So, you know, we know that can be, well, I think no matter what job you work in, human resources can be a challenge. Like how do you recruit, retain um, uh, good people into the work, support them, um, and and then how do you do that amongst, um, again, with Indigenous teachings and um, within the complexities of some of our, our settings, whether that's um, within a First Nations community or within an Indigenous health program within a non-Indigenous setting, um, and navigating all of, all of those um, systems. So um, things like planning, proposal, um, how to develop proposals, uh, how to develop budgets. So sort of that nitty gritty stuff. Uh, there's sort of a whole course on the nitty gritty, uh, which some people love and some people have a harder time with. Um, and then we have um, um, a program, uh, the course that we're currently doing with the current cohort is on uh, evaluation um, policies and research. So again, this is, you know, how do you envelop, uh, evaluate to see if your programs are are doing what you want them to, and then also how you navigate, you know, working with your funders. Maybe they have a different idea of how to approach an evaluation and, um, you know, how um, staying true to um, our Indigenous ways um, in that, both with evaluation and research. So, you know, if the community is getting approached or organization to be a part of research, how do you assess whether this is a a good partnership or not, and how do you protect your community to ensure that um, they're not being um, taken advantage of, and that it really is a, as our instructor, um, this last couple of weeks, Christopher Horse Thief was like, go toe to toe, we want toe to toe partnerships <laughs> when it comes to research. Um, and then we've got a course on information management and looking at um, how to protect um, client um, information. And then, <clears throat> Um, there is a whole course on just looking at Indigenous health and wellness from Indigenous perspectives and teachings and looking at traditional healing. So that um, is one whole course, but it's also interwoven throughout the entire program. Um, 
So that's the general overview of the entire program. Um, uh, with so you can read into each um, one as well on the the website to to learn more specifically about each course. We also have um, an iHelp handbook on the website that has more detail that you can have a look at. Um, and um, <clears throat> so that the, that information is there as well. And then you can always also reach out to uh, Cynthia's left her her email in there too if you have more questions uh, as you're going through the application process. Um, I think um, we'll do one more slide and then I'll turn it over to, to Auntie Doris. Um, so next slide. So it's how will the program support my career, but it's also how will it support your families and your communities and your programs that you work with or, or hope to work with. So as I said, some people um, are, some people come to the program, they don't have a job and they're looking to have this um, increase their skill set um, to help them find a job. Some people um, are in um, different Indigenous health leadership roles, whether that's, I think leadership is broad. Uh, leadership can, you know, it could be a um, health director or an executive director, but it could also be a, a coordinator of a program. It's all, we are all leaders in the work that we do um, in, in our um, communities. <clears throat> so, so it's there to support your employability, um, um, whether that's to stay in your current job get a new job or um or get a promotion and we celebrate those when people share them in the program sometimes people are like i got a new job and we celebrate that um and then also it's it's a very unique skill set and i continue to advocate for this because it's not it's not easy to navigate all of these um complex um health systems and um systemic racism and um uh, trauma and all those pieces that our, our communities are dealing with. So it is a highly desirable skill set to to know how to work with Indigenous people in a, um, a skilled and in an ethical and good way, provide those culturally safe services. So, um, so it is a, you know, a support to um, uh, both your communities and organizations, but also, you know, if you are seeking in employment and then building relationships and networks. We've talked about that uh, to also support and enhance your work. Um, and so we did a, a, a more in-depth evaluation in 2020 about the program and 88% of the graduates reported they found employment in the health field or moved into more desirable roles or that the program added value to their existing role. So some don't have a plan to you know change jobs, but they just want this program to help them do their job in, in um, in a better way. Okay, so I want to now invite uh, Auntie Doris to say a few words. Um, she comes and joins um, circles with us um, and also um, comes and um, celebrates at the graduation. And um, uh, when we are in person, we are on uh, the Vancouver UBC campus on, on Musqueam, uh, unceded traditional lands and um, and uh, Auntie Doris, we call her Auntie, um, uh, she comes to um, to be with us, so. Good morning, thank oh. you, Melanie. Sorry, my camera doesn't work, and so I put this background up. If I, if I don't have the little video on, all it shows is a little white rectangle, so. My computer's well, old. I apologize. That's okay. Well, it looks relaxing, relaxing to be at the beach there. <laughs> oh, wouldn't that be lovely? <laughs> anyway, good morning, everyone. Um, I apologize for uh, taking so much time to get here. It's been a rough past few days, but uh, we're all here, and it's so wonderful to see you all. And uh, I, listening to you, Melanie, it just made me think that so many people could benefit from this beautiful course that I know a lot of doctors that could benefit greatly from taking this course as well. <laughs> it, it just 
it yeah it would be a benefit to everybody but anyway so if you could all just get comfy in your chair and put both feet flat on the floor great spirit we raise our hands in gratitude to you for bringing us together this beautiful day we thank you for helping to keep our hearts and minds open as we go through these beautiful circles, because we can pretend these are circles that we're in. We have good imaginations that you've gifted to us. And as we sit in this beautiful circle, we know that our heart and mind will be open so that we can learn the most and benefit the most from everything that we're about to learn. We thank you for keeping us healthy and safe, safe from all harm, including the harm we sometimes do to ourselves. Help us to remember, Great Spirit, that we are not alone in this journey, that there are many that we are going to meet and maybe people that we have been friends with that we're finding again through the help of this course. Help us to remember that if we have questions, it's okay to ask them because chances are there are many others who have the same question. Help us to remember that this course has been put together to benefit us. And so many that I have witnessed to go through out and take this course and maybe even take it again because they enjoyed it so much has changed their lives all for the better. I've witnessed people changing their attitude from beginning to the end of the course in the graduation and being so happy that they've learned so much and learned so much about themselves. So we thank you, Great Spirit, for all the beautiful learnings for the ones who have come to educate us we thank you for putting them in our lives. I humbly ask that you remember to thank the people that are there to support you, your families, your friends, maybe co-workers. We thank you, Great Spirit, for putting all these beautiful souls into our lives to help us through our journey. And I stand before you humbly, Great Spirit, asking that you continue to protect these beautiful souls. I thank you, I thank you, I thank you. So everyone enjoy and remember at the end of the day, about two hours before you go to bed, to have nice drinks of water to help integrate what you've learned today into your body. And it also flushes away negative and toxic energy that may block you from remembering what you've learned. So take care of yourselves. You're not alone. And thank you for coming. Thank you. Thanks, Melanie. Thank you, Auntie. I felt myself <clears throat> settling and calming, uh, listening to you and, and getting us connected um, connected in our spirits today. So, Wichka, thank you. Thank you very um, much. Have a good day, guys. Yeah, you too. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so um, so we'll continue on. Just got a couple more slides, and and then we'll get to uh, question and answer. Uh, so, in terms of um, uh, what education and experience do you need to apply to the program? Um, so we welcome learners from a variety of backgrounds. Um, so either with or without previous academic experience, um, um, but and also experience working in health or not are not, um, but as I said, we, we are, this is for people that already have an understanding of Indigenous um, people, um, uh, whether, you know, Indigenous themselves or, um, and some that are Indigenous themselves are, are just reconnecting as well and learning about their, their culture. A lot of our people have been disconnected from their communities and their families and their ancestors. And um, so um, this program, you know, is, is an opportunity to to make some of those connections. Um, 
but in terms of our our non-indigenous um, um, participants, uh, as I said, we're uh, the priority is given to indigenous people, but we also bring in allies that do have um, that are living and working within indigenous communities. So sometimes there's indigenous um, or non-indigenous people working in health leadership roles in indigenous communities, and we want to support them to um, to build their skills to support their communities. Um, so, um, so these are the following requirements. So graduation from grade 12 or equivalent, um, internet access. So some of the courses are virtual. So, um, you know, having, having the ability to have, um, the Wi-Fi. you know, sometimes people have a little bit of challenges with their Wi-Fi and might need to turn the cameras off, but, um, um, being able to, um, access internet. And then assignments are usually done on uh, word processing, so having um, access to that. And um, experience in an Indigenous health care program or facility or experience working in an Indigenous community or organization. So some people might have been working in an Indigenous community in a different um, setting, um, and then now they want to work in health. Um, and willing to contribute to group discussions and projects and encourage other participants. So. <clears throat> really, the learning happens amongst the participants, and so much of the wisdom and experience um, and learning comes from um, everyone that's in in the learning community. Um, so, willingness to to contribute. Um, we do create um, small learning pods. Um, we've got like the whale and the wolf and the eagle, and uh, so people go through a learning pod throughout the whole program. So you get to know a a, a smaller group of people that. Um, that you can learn from throughout throughout the program. Okay. Okay, so next slide. So of course it's important to see if this program would fit within your life. <clears throat> um, so this is uh, what the course schedule and time commitments looks like. And, and maybe Kevin or Gloria might have more to add in terms of what the reality is like for them. Um, but uh, as I said, the courses alternate between being virtual and in person. So um, we've done this um, blended format um, uh, because the cost to travel down to Vancouver can be quite a lot for people that are coming from remote areas or from other provinces. Um, and so um, having the opportunity to do some of the courses from home um, means that people don't have to leave their, their work or their uh, family uh, um, of course, they need to dedicate the time for class, um, but uh, but otherwise not having the time with the travel um, and the cost of the travel. So so we've uh, we keep playing with the mix of how much in person and how much virtual, and uh, getting feedback from the participants on what's working and not working for them. Um, um, and uh, we've also kind of followed a little bit of the cold season and the winter season in terms of travel. Uh, and which courses are virtual uh, in the winter. Just lost an ear pod. Um, <clears throat> and so there's also weekly readings and sometimes the readings are videos or podcasts as well because we're always looking for voices from indigenous people. So roughly about two hours per week. Um, and then um, the virtual sessions are held on Fridays from 9.30 to noon. Um, and then, as I said, the residencies are full days, but Thursday, Friday, Saturday. Um, so that, again, condensing it so people get the chance to, they don't have to fly and travel as, as frequently. Um, and then there are assignments and online discussions. Um, each course roughly has about three assignments. Um, so maybe about two to four hours per week uh, on working on those. And then we have our optional virtual tea with our peer, peer support mentor role, um, which it happens just before class on the Fridays, from 9 to 9.30. Um, and that can just be, a, you know, because it's virtual, we don't get that hangout by the coffee and tea and um, as people are kind of milling and in, coming into a room. So it's that opportunity to check in and just be with each other and um, get support on homework too, if, if needed. Um, and then the program includes circles, small group discussions, lectures, um, 
uh, with plenty of time to learn concepts, ask questions. You can reach out to your instructors, your peer support person, um, and practice and apply the learning to your community. Okay, so um, maybe two more slides and then we'll go to question and answer. <clears throat> So how do how do you apply? Um, so we have a formal uh, admissions procedure. We do have um, a review committee of all Indigenous uh, people that review the applications. Um, and there are limited spaces um, in the program. Um, and so uh, we want to ensure that uh, students are properly supported and set up for success of the program. Um, so if you are thinking of applying, it's good to apply for that early. Uh, application review date of March 4th. Um, and then the final application deadline is April 3rd. Um, and so applications are accepted up to four weeks in advance of the program start date. Um, and uh, the last couple of years, we've also started a, a wait list as well. So um, um, the Oh, number, oh, sorry, I just saw a question. Number of students per, co per, per cohort, uh, roughly 20 to 25. Um, that's, I, we find the sweet spot in terms of uh, a nice learning environment where people feel can feel uh, seen and heard um, and uh, have a variety of, of voices in the, in the circle as well. Okay, so. One more slide. How are participants selected? So we welcome applicants from a wide range of backgrounds. So the things that we consider are your, your passion to contributing to Indigenous health and wellness. It's important to articulate that in your application. Um, the alignment of your interests and goals with program approaches and learning objectives. So have a review of uh, you know, the iHelp handbook and what's on the website and um, speak to um, how your your interest in Indigenous health, um, uh, both in your career, but also supporting uh, your community in their health and wellness. Um, the suitability of your previous education and work experience. Uh, so we do ask people to submit a resume so we, uh, we can see the types of uh, roles and work that you've done. Um, but as I said, some people are, um, some are not currently working and wanting to get into uh, working for Indigenous peoples, uh, so um, this is the you know program can support them to to do that, and then your potential to benefit Indigenous communities in, in your health work, and then we notify you via email um, re regarding acceptance in the program. And Cynthia will be your main person that you uh, communicate with around the application process. She's our rock in the program, and she's. Um, uh, got a steady hand on on what's going on uh, with everything um, throughout the process. So, okay, so um, we'll answer the questions and then um, uh, we could actually walk you through on Canvas uh, or on the website how how to apply. Um, so, I don't know, Serene, do you want to flag some questions for me? Yeah, yeah, I have a few here. <laughs> um, our first one. Uh, is, are there any bursaries for this program? Uh, wondering where one can get funding to attend this program if not covered by a nation. Yeah. And so we have a mix of people that attend the program. Um, some are um, within British Columbia, some are in different provinces. We've had some also join from, um, we had an Inuit nurse join us from, from up north. Um, so people are working in different um, areas um, uh, or geographies. And then also, um, you know, there, there's some uh, First Nations um, applicants and some Métis, and there are different uh, funding sources out there um, uh, for different uh, programming that you could have a look at. Um, but also, um, um, you know, so some people ask their employer if they might um, uh, help sponsor them. So that's what, um, uh, like Gloria shared, her employers uh, sponsor her to Take the program because there is a you know it's a really strong professional development aspect to this program um if you're not currently employed then you know that's not an option but um 
Um, and then, you know, some people do um, ask their nation as well. And I know every nation has a different criteria in terms of what, what they might be funding or not funding. If you are having trouble um, finding uh, funding, you can reach out to us and um, we are still reviewing options for bursaries. Um, so just make sure you stay on our newsletter. Someone could pop that in the chat as well. Um, um, uh, or we might be able to, you know, connect you with looking at some different options uh, that you might be able to apply for. Great. Okay. Um, our next question is, do you have a specialized instructor to deal with grief and loss? That's a great question. In fact, um, uh, I love it when I get questions like this too, because we're always looking at what, what, what might be um, some areas in the program that we want to enhance. Um, and grief and loss is definitely, you know, an area that um, that our communities are dealing with. Um, you know, mental health and wellness um, uh, is not, you know, number one issue in many of our communities. Um, and you know, people dealing with multiple losses, um, that sort of complicated grief, the uh, multiple losses in communities. So I'd say all of our instructors have um, um, some background in terms of you know, working with Indigenous people and from trauma-informed lenses. Um, uh, and we bring in different guest instructors too sometimes to to share on different um, areas. Um, and um, so we have had um, guests that have come in the past that have spoken to that specific area. Um, so yeah, thank you. Oh, Gloria has her hand up. Oh, Gloria, yeah. Oh, you're on mute or something's not working with your son. <laughs> How's that? Yeah. Working. Thank you. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> now, we didn't have a course, you know, titled Grief and Loss per se, but what I noticed is is there was like all through the course and the program, we've talked about trauma-informed care. We've talked about um, historical trauma and intergenerational trauma and how that affects our people today and how to, how to work with educating others about it, especially, but also um, patient care and direct patient services and, and how that can play out. So I, I wanted, just wanted to say that I did learn some, some new uh, skills on on navigating that and and working with patients and how to advise other professionals about trauma informed care. So thank you. Great, thanks, Gloria. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. Um, our next question is: Does this course have credits that can be used to obtain a higher degree? Um, also an amazing question. Um, <laughs> So uh, this program uh, sits within uh, the extended learning space, uh, which is um, sort of more in the professional development realm, I would say. Um, so, so the um, uh, so they're not formal credits towards um, other university programs, except that we do have a, a special um, partnership that we're working on right now with the Masters in Health Administration uh, program. Um, at uh, UBC, um, and they're keen to bring in more Indigenous people into their program. And so they're bridging a, a big divide um, in the university and um, offering some credit towards the iHealth um, participants in their program. So, um, so we're continuing to look for opportunities like that for our, for our participants um, to help them with their further education. We also connect people with other programs that we have too. The the Indigenous Public Health Institute. Uh, some of our participants take both programs. Maybe some, maybe not at the same time, but uh, we do have other programs that we offer at, at the Center for Excellence in Indigenous Health. Um, and that program um, is a graduate certificate, and that there are that is a four credit program as well. So uh, be sure to be on our newsletter uh, if you aren't already to to learn about that program as well. Thank you. Uh, our next question is, how long has this program been in existence? Since 2004. So it is a longstanding program. Um, and I, um, 
I think that's important because I think it shows that there's a need um, for this program uh, for for people working in Indigenous health to be able to gather and um, uh, learn from each other and learn from Indigenous instructors and um, support each other and um, and that um, and that the program has been able to be sustained through that time frame. Um, you know, it, it can be challenging working in a university setting to to really create that safe, culturally safe space. Um, and uh, I believe that we've been able to do that and support our, our participants to, um, you know, be in a learning environment that's really impacting uh, their careers and their, their communities. Thank you. Um, so we have someone uh, just wondering if, um, if they were to be uh, admitted into the course and um, they were to miss like a Thursday or a Friday due to work um, because they work for their community, would it be detrimental to their success in the course? Yeah, great question. Um, so we, we ask, you know, ask people as they're considering the program to look at how it might fit into their life um, and their work. So, you know, blocking off those dates um, in their, in their calendar, talking to their employer about being able to be there for class um, and also important to articulate in your application too, that you would have that kind of support. Um, and, and also to, so Fridays, um, you know, 9.30 to noon for the virtual classes, being able to take that, that time for class. Um, and then we do have some, as I said, we, you know, we do have some flexibility. So, you know, if something does come up, um, you know, someone's sick or there's a crisis in the community that someone, you know, really needs to deal with uh, or loss um, that uh, we do have a, a process for making up, make up assignments. Um, so of course, you do miss in the the richness of the the learning in terms of being with with everyone together in per, either in person or virtual. Um, so it's hard to replicate that. And also some of like our last instructor he really did a whole story arc. It was really storytelling with a lot of pictures in his slides. So reviewing the slides um, afterwards is a little bit hard to understand all that happened. Um, so um, <clears throat> so it is you know best to um, really reflect on whether you would have the time in your work and uh, family life to um, to do the program. And then we do have some flexibility as well to support uh, our participants because we know that can be a challenge for indigenous learners going into a post-secondary setting sometimes that programs aren't uh, you know sort of allowing for that flexibility i'd say at any given point in time about a third of our participants are going through some sort of major crisis in their family or their community um, it's just the reality of what our people are dealing with um, and that's, you know, that's, that's hard and that's challenging. And, you know, we do our best to support each other, support their participants to go through the program, um, given that reality. Thank you. Uh, what should references be prepared to address and share about the applicant? Mm -hmm. um, we don't always necessarily contact the references, um, but it's good for us to see who, who your references are and who, who, um, you know, supports you in your work and would speak for you. So, um, uh, so knowing who who they are and uh, what their you know their job title is, where they work, um, maybe if they're from a if they're indigenous, um, you know, just including that in your reference list. Uh, our next question is: Is there such thing as a senior discount? <clears throat> I'll defer to <laughs> Cynthia or Karen on that one. I don't. <laughs> Do we have? We don't. That's have a. Opinion. That's a great question. <laughs> yeah, we 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 don't generally have a a seniors discount. I mean, we have found when we've we've done some um, follow up surveys with with uh, I help grads that you know eighty five ninety percent are able to find funding um, from from different, uh, different sources. And Cynthia has a list that she can share uh, with, with people who, who are looking for funding. Um, so that's, 
Generally, yeah, that's generally what we do. We do have a discount, though, paying at a certain point ahead of time. Is that right, Cynthia? Yeah, that's correct. If you're able to pay the full amount um, in in one installment, um, then you save $100. Um, if not, you can also pay in two installments. Thank you. Um, is there an option for 100% virtual participation? Mm, unfortunately, no. The in-person part is really important to um, um, build the connections. Um, it's such a rich opportunity for us to be able to be together in person. I have just like been blown away by some of our circles. I just like get goosebumps. My My hands feel like they have energy balls in them. It's just like the power of the sitting in, in circle with all these amazing Indigenous people um, uh, is just incredible. So, so we, so the in-person part is, uh, you know, a mandatory part of the program. So be, you know, reflecting on your situation and whether that uh, would be possible for you. Again, of course, we do have flexibility, you know, if someone is sick, um, things like that. We, you know, find ways to still support people. Uh, if they do have to miss that part. And um, do you accept non-Indigenous applicants that support the FNHA nursing team and nurses in communities? So, so we do give priority to Indigenous um, uh, learners, uh, but we do um, also accept uh, people that do work within Indigenous settings, um, so living and working in Indigenous, living or working in Indigenous settings. Um, uh, so we do consider those applications as well. Great. And our last question is, uh, does the course teach uh, how to deal with lateral violence that most uh, Indigenous communities experience, especially in smaller communities? Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes, do you want to speak to that, Gloria? <laughs> I'm, I'm certainly there's a spectrum and and it's 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 um, different in a small community versus working in a non indigenous organization, but lateral violence still happens. And one of the things that that I really appreciated was when our instructors were talking about, especially our, our recent instructor, um, Christopher Horsley, was talking about how he was doing engagement in the communities and being from that community, how difficult that was and how he navigated, you know, negative comments and, and supported people on being able to have the courage to come out and ask for what they needed. And then also um, how to deal with with the lateral violence and you know the relevancy and and just I think addressing it. So, I mean, it, it would take a bit more time for me to describe, but I do know that um, now when I'm dealing, especially with um, our First Nations community here, and they're distraught and they're stepping out and they're disagreeing with me on something, I step back you know, where before I would want to jump in and fix it or question it or say, why are you saying that? I help us uh, taught me how to just step back and but remain in the picture and remain consistent in building that mutual trust and respect. So it, it, it's a gentle process and a fragile process, but I think I've learned and I wish I could put it more into words, everybody, but it, it, it's a thing that happens where, where you just find yourself dealing with people differently. Thank you, Gloria. And I know the different instructors um, each come with different experiences as well, as well as the participants in the group. So, you know, all the discussions, you know, the, this is the reality of working in our communities is dealing with lateral violence. Um, and so all these sort of topics are sort of interspersed woven through, <laughs> that was easier to say, um, um, into the into the program conversation. One thing I, I wanted to add too is, is it was made really clear to me that when lateral violence is happening, especially with our own people, it's a trauma response. So look at it from that frame, that, that th this is historical trauma coming out, you know, and, yeah. and so anyway, thank you. Thank you. And I see just a follow-up to Monica's um, question there she's put 
um, some information about, uh, I guess maybe from the UBC website. Um, I was just say, Monica, just contact us. We'll we'll uh, we'll discuss that further with you. I think that was the last question. Now, um, okay. Yeah. Do you, I'll hand it to you to share your closing remarks, Melanie and team. Okay. And then uh, I'll end the webinar. Okay. So um, there there is a recording of this session. So feel free to share with any uh, friends, family, or colleague that you think might be interested. And then if you have further questions, you can reach out to us um, as you're uh, working on your application. Um, please feel free to connect. Um, and um, uh, just, yeah, thank you for your time today and to uh, the team and um, our um, uh, amazing participants, uh, Gloria and Kevin, uh, for coming and sharing their experience with the program today. Yeah, so. Uh, really means a lot, and I'll also thank uh, our auntie for joining us today and, and getting us grounded. <clears throat> okay, thank I you. Think, um, yeah. Thank you to all our guests and to everyone for joining us today. Thank you so much, Melanie, Cynthia, Gloria, Emily, Doris, Karen, Zonia, and Kevin for the amazing discussion and learning more about uh, the iHealth program and answering some of our questions about the program. Um, uh, we just, uh, just before we end the webinar, we'd love for you to check out our website, um, for our upcoming learning circles. Um, uh, we have a few, um, going to be coming in March. Um, so keep an eye out for that and you can sign up for our newsletter, uh, um, in the link in the chat, all the webinars are free to sign up for on our website at www.learningcircle.ubc.ca. And thank you everyone for joining us. We look forward to seeing you all at our next learning circle. Lin Lin, thank you.